There is also Olsen in the show. Yeah, oh, Olsen I, I, was a big surprise for me because I've only shown it four times. I probably haven't seen it up since it was up at Saatchi's. Maybe, I don't know. The pieces from 86. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, a long time ago. Yeah. And uh, I was very happy here. And I actually closed it in a bit. Before we had it open at the end about four feet and we pulled it together at 3.6 or even 3.5. And I did that because... When you get around four feet, they start reading as two plates. You bring it into around three, six at the opening, it starts reading as one volume, and it makes the space interior more palpable, more, you start feeling the volume of the space. When it gets too wide, they start dividing themselves into two plates, not as one contained space. And I was more interested in keeping that contained space. So when we were setting the piece here, they had set it at four feet, and then I told them to keep moving it in. We moved it into three, uh, six, and then I just told them to nudge it again into three five. Okay, that was. But I, I'm I'm happy with Olsen yeah, here. No, I, yeah. I mean, for me, Olsen and Pessoa, uh, and and Strike are the, are the bigger pieces for me in this show. Are the pieces that I, I keep going back to. I think Strike looks very good here. It looks very good, good yeah. And you mean the the torqued ellipses are also uh, an important step in your work. I mean, the, uh, enormous. Enormous, yeah. Yeah. Enormous. And, and it, I, I think tell us the, this nice story about uh, your visit of uh, San Carlo alle Quattro Fontane, the Borromini Church in Rome, I think, which had uh, influence on, on this. Would, would you like me to... Yeah, yeah, it's a nice story. story. Yeah, I okay. think not everybody knows the story. So, and it's a Swiss architect, so we have, you see, in a way. <laughs> yeah, oh, okay, I'll, I'll go through the story. I walked into um, San Carlo and uh, Quattro Fontane in Rome, and if you know the church... Um, there's an oval on the floor and there's an oval above, about 30 or 40 feet high. And uh, I walked in, which has a, an elaborate kind of uh, fenestration in it, and I walked in on a side aisle and I misread it. And I thought that the oval on the ground wasn't um, vertically placed with the oval above it. I thought actually it was turned. And when I walked to the center, I realized that my misreading was wrong. That actually it was just like an oval that rose um, perpendicular to the ceiling. But I was more interested in my misreading. And I thought, well, what if you could do that? What if you could take an oval on the ground, a void, and an oval overhead that was at an angle to it, and let's take the most extreme case, let's make it a right angle. So you have an oval on the ground, and you have an oval in the air at a right angle to it, and now what would happen if you could make a form around that, those two ovals? Now, those two ovals are the same size. So as this form rises in elevation, the radius is not going to change. Now, if you think about conical shapes, like a flower pot or a lampshade, the radius changes. You know, you know, lampshade, flower pot, different radiuses. All right, so you're coming up vertically, and you're going to have an, an oval form, on the ground, an oval form uh, at a right angle to it, and you're going to put a skin around it. Let's say the skin is steel. But I didn't know how to do it. So I was close to Frank Gehry, and he had a, someone working there who had come out of the aerospace industry who was a computer nut. So I said to him, um, could I make a form where there was an oval on the ground, a void, and an oval overhead uh, at an angle to it? He said, what angle? I said, make it at a right angle. Let's take the most extreme case. And could we wrap a skin around it? He said, what material? I said, it doesn't even matter, Can any material, but we'll get to that later. And he said, I don't know. I, I don't think so. I don't think it's been done. I don't think it's in seashells or nature. I've never seen it in architecture. But anyway, we're building the museum for Frank Gehry and Bill Bowen. I can't play with you right now. And I thought, oh, screw this guy. I'll, I'll, I'll do it myself. So we took um, a piece of wood shaped like an oval, and we put, a guy I worked with, Alan Gladder actually, really was helpful in coming up with this, and we put um, a spool between it, a, a leg, and, like a wheel, and then we put another oval at a right angle to it. So now you have a piece of wood on the ground, and you have a piece of wood above it, and you have a, right, a, a spoke between the two, like the back of a tricycle, right? Only if when you were a kid and the, the wheel broke on your tricycle and it inscribed a line on the snow or in the mud, it wouldn't be a parallel line because it would roll like this, right? 
So the line would go like that, which like in computer technology or math is a sine wave, right? So we thought, okay, we'll take a piece of lead, we'll lay it out on the floor, and we'll take this wheel that we've made as at a right angle to itself, which is this broken wheel, and we'll roll the lead up in the wheel. When you do that, the lead wraps itself around the wheel. Then we cut off what was extending over the top of the wheel and the bottom of the wheel, and the wheel represents the void. And we thought, Jesus, we've got it. We've got this form that if you turn it upside down or right and left, it's rising in an elevation, and the radius hasn't changed. So then we thought, well, we need to make the template. How are we going to do that? So we unfurled it. We, we opened it up and laid it on the ground. When you unfurl it, you have a curve like this and a curve like that. But we didn't know how to make the bending pattern to, to make it into a piece of steel that would then remake that form. So I phone up the engineer at Frank Geary's office and I say, listen, I'm going to send you a template of what, we, what I think we need to make to make this piece that I had talked to you about. So we sent him, we faxed him out, a, 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 or email, I think we faxed it actually, a template out to him, and he phones back immediately, and he said, did you use a CAD too? <laughs> I said, no, we used a nail and a piece of wood. And he said, we can play with you tomorrow. Then it came, how are we going to get this animal that no one had ever seen before made? No one could make it. We went everywhere. Clara and I went to Korea. The Koreans thought they could make it. The problem with the Koreans is that they only make steel, I think it's called Bosco, they only make steel uh, 12 feet high. If you're making a form like this, you have to recut it. And if, when, when you cut it, it means that the elevation is going to come down to about 10 feet. I thought that we needed at least 12 or 14 feet to make these pieces resonate, and we were making the models with our little wood models about 12 or 14 feet, and I wanted the pieces to at least be 12 or 14 feet. So then we went to different places, and no one knew how to make it. And finally we found a place in uh, Baltimore. Um, what was it? you remember the name? No, it wasn't Bethlehem. Yeah, that's not Bethlehem. Sunship, Beth Ship. Yeah, Beth, Beth, Bethlehem, no, was it Beth, was it Beth Ship? Beth Ship. Beth Ship, okay. <laughs> we don't know the place here. So. <laughs> I'm not sure it was Beth Ship, but nevertheless, it was the, the, the name of the plant itself was called Sparrows Point. And we went there, and they thought that they could make the form. Because they had read it as two conical shapes, one turned this way and one turned that way, so that when they met in the center, they were going to kind of fake the other bending line. So we had this plate 40 feet long, maybe 45 feet long, in the press, and they were bending it. And they got to the center, and they put a lot of compression on it, and they weren't hitting the right line. And I kept telling them, look, these aren't cones inverted. You're not really following what we need to do. And in order to follow what they thought they had to do, they had to put more pressure on the plate. And they took a railroad tie and they put it in there to put more pressure on the plate. And I was standing at the end of the press watching it, and it sounded like lightning, and the plate fluttered like that, and my blood went out of my legs, and I thought I was dead. I thought this thing was going to come right off at me, because it just cracked, and we broke a two and a half inch steel plate, 40 feet long, right in half, and it flittered and then fell to the ground. And then I thought, well, what am I going to do now? We just made 40, 40 grand down the toilet. What, what are we going to do now?